Okay, so for the rest of the semester, we're going to be working with observational data rather than experimental data um, to be able to find causal effects using observational data. Um, and we'll be relying heavily on causal, uh, causal models or DAGs to be able to know what to adjust for to isolate the one arrow between treatment and outcome. Um, and so we've been talking about adjustment throughout the semester since we've been learning about DAGs. Um, and I keep saying, just hold off, just pretend that you're controlling for the, the confounders and, and that's sufficient for now. Um, what we're going to talk about now is how you can actually adjust things kind of more correctly instead of just including confounders as control variables in a regression. Um, so let's talk about matching and why we can do adjustment using matching. Um, we've already done this a little bit. Um, when we looked at this example here, um, when we talked about average treatment effects and um, um, weighted averages and other things like that. And so this is from the Methods Matter textbook. And so what, what these researchers did here is they wanted to see the effect of um, going to private school on earnings. Um, the way they were able to do that was by grouping these students into to groups that are very similar. So group A all applied to the same private and public schools um, and were all admitted and rejected from those same schools. And then kind of some randomly decided to go to private and randomly decided to go to public. That's the unconfoundedness assumption um, where the choice, ultimate choice here was just kind of random. Um, group B also applied to the same schools and were admitted to all of the same schools, but then randomly chose to go to either private or public. And so by comparing these students within their groups, um, we were able to find the average treatment effect um, by controlling for or adjusting for group. Um, and we did this a couple sessions ago when we drew a DAG and we said student characteristics influence both the choice to go to school and earnings. Um, and so if we adjust for that, um, then we can remove the effect of student characteristics and find kind of the, the general causal effect. Um, and so the way we adjusted for it then was by kind of getting rid of group characteristics here by matching based on group. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about for this section here is how we can use this idea of matching um, in a more general sense to um, get rid of any confounding that happens um, between your treatment and your outcome. Um, there are a whole bunch of good reasons why you should match your data. Um, one is kind of a more mathy reason is it reduces model dependence. This is the idea that you can run a model a whole bunch of different ways. You can throw different coefficients into it. You can square some of your variables. You can do a whole bunch of stuff, log stuff, take the square root of stuff um, to make your lines fit your data. And as you're doing all of that mathy stuff, um, the findings that you get will be different depending on how you build the model. Um, and so that leaves a lot of room for researcher discretion in how you're trying to find the causal effect, which then leads to bias. And I'll show some examples of this in just a minute here. Um, matching is also good because it lets you compare apples to apples. Um, you're comparing groups that are similar because you've gotten rid of all of the confounding characteristics. And so now um, when you're comparing two different groups, you've gotten rid of all of the things that make them different. And now they're basically the same and you can talk about causal effects. Um, it's also a way to adjust for backdoors. Um, this is kind of the, the general best way um, to handle um, observational causal inference if you're not doing any of the fancier models like regression discontinuity or instrumental variables. Um, if you just have a general DAG with, or a general data set with a DAG that has a whole bunch of confounders in it, you don't have a fancy research design. Um, this is one way of approaching it is by using matching with the confounders to help isolate that causal effect. Um, it's a very common method for doing this if you don't have fancier research designs. Um, so this model dependence idea, let's look at that. Let's say you have a data set that looks like this. This is fake data. There's some outcome, and as education goes up, um, outcome changes here. And so um, there are some people that got a program. That's the red dots here. The blue dots did not get the program. They were untreated. So if we just draw a regular regression a regression line here, and we control for whether people are treated or untreated. So we include an indicator variable for treatment. Um, we'll run this model here. And this is the causal effect we see. Look how big that is. It's going from like seven to 10. That's like a three unit difference in the outcome. 
Um, that's our causal effect. We can then publish it and say, this program's great. People who are treated, on average, have a three unit higher outcome, hooray. Um, but looking at this picture, you will probably feel very uncomfortable saying that because those lines don't fit at all. Um, they fit this way because of how math works, um, where this is the general slope. And then because we have the, the treatment here, that's just shifting um, the line around the y-axis. The intercept is just changing. And so if we run a model like this, that's how big our causal effect is. So then we say, this line doesn't really fit. It's kind of more curvy. There's a group here, and then it goes up, and then it goes down. So we want to make it more curvy. Um, you can make lines curvy by squaring them, and then they turn into parabolas. And so if we throw in an education squared term, so we control for education and for education squared, then we get a model that looks like this. And it, it fits the data a lot better. It's curvy now. And if you look at the causal effect, that's the difference between the blue and the red here, it's much smaller. Um, before it was like this three unit difference, now it's maybe one unit difference. And so now we publish this paper and say, it's not actually three, it's one. Um, we could then throw in a log term, we can square root something, we can cube something, we can do all sorts of model things, um, mathy things to that model to make it fit perfectly. Um, but that causal effect is going to change depending on how we specify the model there. And that leaves all sorts of room for bias. Um, we could report that and then tell funders that our program works really well. We could report this and say the program doesn't work very well. Which one do you choose? Uh, probably this squared one, maybe. Um, but there are other ways of getting at this that reduce the dependency on the actual model form um, and make it so even if we square it, it's going to be roughly the same. Um, and whatever mathy tricks we throw at it, it's still going to be about the same. So one thing we can do is instead of using the whole data set, we can only look at a subset of the data. And hopefully you can see this. Um, there are some clusters in the data that don't have any treated people in them. Um, so, for instance, right here, these shaded or these more transparent blue dots here and here, we can probably safely ignore them because there are no treated people here. We can't compare these highly educated people with anybody who got treatment, and we can't compare any of these people with low levels of education who, with people who got the treatment because nobody who got treatment is down in that world or in this world. So if we instead only focus on this world here and we run our basic regression model, this is what we get initially. If we just use regular education, look how big that causal effect is now. It's tiny. Um, because, and it's negative now, it's going down. Before it was kind of flat because it was trying to incorporate these other groups, but we've gotten rid of those groups and so now it's a negative slope and there's a tiny effect that comes from treatment. Not statistically significant at all. Um, so then we want to tinker with the math and let's square education. Maybe we can shrink the effect size or grow the effect size. Here's what it is when we square it. It's the same. Um, because it's going through the same, more narrower set of data um, where the data is better matched at this point. So how do we know that we can remove those points? Why can we legally get rid of these guys here? Um, and the reason is because of matching. Um, we have, there are lots of different ways that we can use um, to determine what points are the best ones to keep in an analysis. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about right now is a few different methods for making sure that you get points that are the most accurate and the most matched. Um, because essentially what this lets us do is create a fake control group um, with these untreated people here um, that we can then compare with the treatment group. And even though it wasn't randomly assigned, this kind of approximates a randomized control trial by getting rid of these other people who don't fit in that world at all. So the general way you go through, uh, the general process you go through for matching is the first step is you pre-process the data, which sounds really fancy, but really it's just you do something to guess the assignment to treatment. And then um, you can use what you know about the DAG to inform this guessing. This is why you want to draw DAGs, um, because that tells you what causes people to 
seek out treatment, um, to seek out your program. And so you want to find people who are similar um, and kind of figure out the whole process there. And then you can find people who were both in the program and who were not in the program, but have similar characteristics based on the DAG. Um, once you pre-process the data, then you estimate the causal effect. You use the new pre-processed data or the trimmed data to build a model, to calculate the difference in means, do whatever statsy things you're doing to measure the effect, but you do it on the pre-processed, trimmed, smaller data. Um, so if we go back to here, that's what we did. Our pre-processing was looking at this and saying, um, these two clusters here, there are no treated people there. Um, and so there's no way we're ever gonna be able to draw a line down here because it is most likely that like these people will never seek out treatment and these people will never get treatment. And so as a result, we can kind of get rid of them. And then we estimate the causal effect only on this cluster here on the pre-processed or the trimmed data. And so then that works. So there are different methods for matching. There's a whole world of, of matching research. You can get a PhD in statistics just on matching. I, go for it. Um, so some of the more common ways to match, um, there's nearest neighbor matching. Um, that you'll often see written as Mahalanobis distance or Euclidean distance matching. Um, you'll often see something called propensity score matching. Um, this is super popular, but for reasons we'll explain in just a minute, it's not the greatest for trying to isolate um, a relationship between X and Y. Um, and we'll, we'll explain some of the math behind that. And then there's this method called inverse probability weighting, um, which is extremely common in epidemiology. Um, it's becoming increasingly more common in social sciences um, because it works really well. You don't throw away any data. Um, you get to keep all of your matched data. Um, they're just weighted differently. And um, the results are a lot more interpretable than just throwing away all of your, all of your non-matched data. There are lots of other methods we're not covering. Um, you can seek them out on your own if you want. Um, just know that they exist. There's a whole bunch of different ways of matching stuff. So we'll talk about a couple of these in more detail here. So the, the idea of nearest neighbor matching is you want to find observations that are very similar to each other. So you find a whole bunch of untreated observations and match them up with treated observations that are basically the same based on all of the confounders. And the only difference is that one of the people got treatment and one of the people didn't. Um, there are a ton of different mathy ways to measure distance. Um, the most common ways are this Mahalanobis distance and Euclidean distance. Um, so we'll talk about each of these right here. Um, you'll see this come up in the wild often. There was this um, report from um, early 2020 that said there's a 70% chance of recession in six months. They were right, um, but not because of their predictions. It's because of COVID. Um, but if you look at the second key point here, it says that the researchers used a scientific approach initially developed to measure human skulls to measure the relationship of four factors for predicting recessions. And that sounds really cool, measuring skull measurements um, to predict recessions. Um, that's just Mahalanobis matching. That's just a matching algorithm. It happened to be used initially to measure human skulls. Um, and when I saw that, I was like, that's the weirdest stats method ever. Um, but it really was used for measuring human skulls. Um, it, the Mahalanobis matching algorithm is named after this guy here, who was an Indian scientist um, who worked closely with British eugenicists in the 1930s to um, figure out good genes and good um, physical characteristics of like IQ and stuff. And so he developed a way of matching um, brain size differences and, and skull size um, to, be able to, to be able to identify different castes in India, um, which is like eugenics right there. Um, he's not the only eugenicist. Um, that pretty much every statistical test is the form of eugenics research, um, which is just great. Um, so stats is kind of built on this foundation from the 1930s, um, and that's just stats. So that's what you're using um, to measure differences, things that were developed to measure good genes and um, phrenology and, and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so Mahalanobis distance is a very common one. You also see Euclidean distance. We'll show some examples of that in a minute. Um, so for this example, we're going to pretend that there's some sort of treatment that leads to some sort of outcome. That relationship is confounded by two things, by age and education. So education influences whether or not you choose treatment and it influences your outcome. 
and age influences whether or not you choose treatment and outcome. So if we plot just the confounders, this has nothing to do with the outcome. This is just, we're gonna look at the relationship between age and education because our goal is we want to find people who are very similar in age and education, but have slightly different outcomes. Some people choose treatment and some people choose to be untreated, but we want people who are basically the same age and same education, just choosing different outcomes. So if we look at this plot here, here's a scatter plot showing education and showing age on the y-axis here. So if you look here, these points, the ones that are clustered close to each other, like these two blue dots right here, they basically have the same level of education and the same age, but they both are untreated. So our goal with matching is to find dots, like right here, that are basically the same education, basically the same age, but one of them was treated and one of them was untreated. So if we find them and find the whole bunch of other matches that are very, very close and use just them for our data set, then um, that's a way of closing the backdoor confounding that comes from age and education. We're adjusting for age and adjusting for education by matching based on those characteristics and then that isolates that causal effect. Um, so our goal here is to basically pair every one of these treated dots with an untreated dot that is very similar. And this is where the distance part comes in. We need to figure out a way to measure how close these things are. Here we could measure it like with a ruler maybe um, and see how far away that is and just choose the closest dots. Once you get into more dimensions, like if you had a third variable here that was also a confounder, you can't use a ruler anymore because now it's like this three-dimensional thing. If you have 20 confounders, good luck. Um, that's why Mahalanobis and Euclidean distances exist. They're fancy mathy ways of basically measuring the distance between points in a whole bunch of different dimensions. So that's, that's basically the, the, the thinking behind this here. So this is ma with Mahalanobis distance. This is what the different matched pairs would look like. Um, so these two are fairly close to each other, and so that's a match. Over here, that's a match. Um, some of these are pretty far, like this person here has higher education, this person only has 15 years of education, but according to the algorithm, that is matched, even though that's probably a better match. The reason why is because there are different ways of matching. This is um, requiring every treated dot to only be paired with one other untreated dot, so this is one-to-one -one matching and no um, repetition is allowed. So once an untreated dot is chosen, it can't be chosen for something else. And so this one, even though that's really close, um, it is the, like, this is the treated dot. It's the closest one to this untreated one. There's nothing else closer. And because we're enforcing one-to-one -one matching without repetition, then we kind of get some odd matches here. If we, we could allow for multiple matches, um, in which case you'd probably have this red dot paired with that one, you'd probably have all three of these red dots paired with that one blue dot. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can specify the, the distance with matching. This is just a simple one-to-one -one version. Um, so once you have everything paired, you basically throw away all the other dots, and then this is your data set that you're left with. Um, each of these dots now is matched based on the confounders um, that influence whether or not you choose to get treatment but this is how you adjust for them. At this point, if we ran a regression and just said we want the effect of treatment on the outcome, if we just use this data set because we've based it, or we've matched based on the confounders, that is how you close the backdoor confounders. And now whatever we get from our regression with treatment explaining outcome, that is our causal effect um, because we've closed the back doors. So some potential problems with this though, is that matching can be very greedy, especially when you're doing the nearest neighbor one-to-one -one matching only, you're throwing away all of these other data points and you're just left with this. And so you might run, um, or you don't have control over this because um, you're not running a, 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 an experiment. Um, but if you look at like power analysis, you might have a really small sample size that's from observational data and you're throwing away half of your data. Um, any finding you find is, probably not going to be statistically significant because you're getting rid of tons of it. And so you don't necessarily want to always match, especially if you don't have a ton of data. So the solution is don't throw everything away. 
Um, and this is where we get into other matching methods that let you keep your data instead of getting rid of the data. So before we explain the main one that we care about, which is inverse probability weighting. That's kind of the best way of matching without throwing away everything. We need to talk about two things before we get there. Um, we need to talk about probability um, or propensity, and we need to talk about weighting. Those are the two parts of inverse probability weighting. So the first part is the idea of propensity or the probability of choosing to be in the treatment group or not in the treatment group. So the way this is calculated is something called a propensity score. You can use a statistical model to predict um, if different rows are going to have a specific outcome. Um, you can do this a whole bunch of different ways. You can use logistic regression. Um, you can use fancy machine learning if you want. Um, this, is, this is used all the time. Like Netflix does this. They calculate propensity scores for you choosing specific movies, and then they offer you, or they they offer you in your suggested next movies. Um, they choose like the top five highly most propenseful, most propitious, uh, most likely movies that you will watch. Um, they put that in their list based on a model that generates scores of how likely it is that you're going to choose that movie. Um, so you can do that for anything. Um, for instance. Here, this is a logistic regression model. It's slightly different. It still has coefficients. But if you look at the left-hand side, um, you instead of just saying treatment, we have this weird log of the probability of treatment over 1 minus the probability of treatment. Um, and because this, this dependent variable is slightly different, um, the coefficients that you get in a logistic regression model can't be interpreted the same way as kind of a normal regression model. But what it does spit out is probabilities. Um, so when you plug stuff into education and age and then um, go through this regression process, it will spit out a um, value between 0 and 1 that is the probability that you will be treated. Um, and so you have actual like predicted probabilities of specific outcomes, which is really cool. Um, so an example of this, using um, CARS data here. So in this plot here, what we have is um, showing the relationship between miles per gallon and whether or not a car is manual transmission or automatic transmission. So manual transmission is coded as 1, and automatic transmission is coded as 0. Um, so 1 means automatic. So notice this line here um, kind of is this S-curve shape. Where if you're down, and what this is showing is the probability of um, having manual transmission. So if you're down here with really low miles per gallon, according to this model, your probability of having a manual transmission is basically zero. It's very highly unlikely that you have manual transmission. Um, as you increase miles per gallon, it becomes more and more and more likely that you'll have manual transmission. So this is the outcome that we're predicting here based on miles per gallon. And the whole world of you know, the predicted outcomes is constrained between 0 and 1. So that's 0% probability, 100% probability is what we have. Um, the way you do this in R is instead of using the LM function that we've been using before for a linear model, use this GLM function, which stands for Generalized Linear Model. And then you tell it a specific family. Um, this just tells it to use logistic regression. Um, you can also do probit regression, which is similar, um, but uh, I like logit better because I do. Um, so that, that's kind of the code you run here. So we're predicting this AM just means automatic or manual. That's a column in this data set that just has ones or zeros. One if it's automatic, zero, or one if it's manual, zero if it's automatic. And then we have explained by miles per gallon in this empty cars data set. Um, the coefficients, again, you don't, you'll never really directly work with these when you're doing inverse probability weighting. It's just kind of a useful thing to know um, of what this kind of model returns. Um, it spits out coefficients just like you've been seeing before. Um, and it looks like you could interpret this as saying like as miles per gallon goes up, the that weird log p over 1 minus p thing increases by 0.3. That's weird. Um, this world right here, if you just get the coefficients out of the model, this is a scale called log odds. Um, so if you remember the equation here, this 
ratio of the probability of being manual over the probability of not being manual, those are odds. And then this log odds is just the, the logged version of that. And so the coefficients you get out, if you just look at the results, are the log odds. They're pretty uninterpretable, uninterpretable by themselves. Um, you can interpret them, though, if you exponentiate them or unlog them. And the way you do that is you basically take the number e, which is like 2.4 something. It's a weird constant thing. It's the way you unlog things. Um, if you take e and raise it to the power of the coefficient, so if we say e to the 0.3, that will turn into 1.36 here. This is something called an odds ratio. Um, and if you tell this tidy function to exponentiate, you say exponentiate equals true, it will automatically go through and raise e to the power of negative 0.6, e to the power of 0.3, and do all of that for you, which is nice. Um, so this is now an odds ratio. The way you interpret this is it's slightly different. You don't need to know this for this class. This is just for your general reference, how you interpret odds ratios. Um, everything with odds ratios is centered around one and it measures the change in likelihood of the outcome happening. So if it is exactly one, that means there's no effect at all. If it's above one, then you talk about it with um, percent changes. So you say, like with this, this is 1.36. That means there's a 36% or for every increase in miles per gallon, the likelihood that you'll have an automatic or you'll have a manual transmission increases by 36% or you're 36% more likely to have a manual transmission as your miles per gallon goes up. If this was under one, like 0.75, then you subtract um, from one. And so if it was 0.75, that would mean that as you increase miles per gallon, then you're gonna be 25% less likely to have a manual transmission. Um, so everything centered around one here, goes up, goes down, depending on how big the number is after the one. But you don't ever have to interpret that for this class. Um, just you will have to run these things to do the inverse probability weighting, but you don't really need to look under the hood here to see um, the actual coefficients. It's just for your reference. So if we have that model and then we plug in all of the different values of miles per gallon back into the model, it will spit out predicted probabilities. This is the magical part of these logistic regression models. So we, we can do that with this function called augment, which means plug in stuff. So we're going to take that model transmission. We're going to take the original car's data and plug each of those rows into our model and tell it to predict the probability of having a manual transmission. So if you look here, this is what we get as a result. We have miles per gallon. We have whether or not it's automatic or manual. M or manual is one here. So these three cars are manual. Everything else is automatic. This last column here is the probability of being manual. Um, so this first row has a 46% chance of being manual. And it was manual, so that was a fairly good chance. Row three had a 59% chance of being manual, and it was manual. Cool. Um, if you look down at row seven here, it only had a 9% chance of being manual. And it wasn't. So good guess, model. Um, Row eight had a 70% chance of being manual, and it wasn't. And so that's weird um, because it, according to this model, it should have been manual, but it wasn't. So cool. So that is what a propensity score is. It's really just a predicted probability of having whatever outcome you have. So if you're thinking about treatment and control instead of automatic and manual, you'll have a column that says treatment or untreated, and then you'll have a column of predicted probabilities that says based on these people's age and income um, or age and education is what our two confounders were. Um, this is the probability that each of these dots have of being treated or not being treated. Um, and so that's a cool thing that you can deal with. So propensity score matching stops there and it basically clusters people by how likely they are. So you would take all of the people who are highly likely to be manual and take all of the people who are highly likely to be automatic and call that matching. Um, but if you do that, there are like, it's a super popular method. It's kind of intuitive to match people who should be similar. Um, but there are a whole bunch of mathy reasons why you shouldn't do that for the purposes of identification. Meaning 
isolating that relationship between X and Y and removing the confounding. Um, propensity scores are fine. We do them all, we use them all the time. We'll use them for inverse probability weighting. We like them. Um, don't be scared of them. Um, when I took causal inference um, my first time back in 2013, um, the professor there was like railing against propensity scores like like this, saying don't ever use them because it's bad for mathy reasons. Um, but I didn't pick up on the fact that it's okay for other things as long as you're not solely relying on propensity scores. And so up until like a couple of years ago, I was terrified of ever using them. And if I saw a paper say, we use propensity score matching, I was like, oh no. Um, you can calculate propensity scores, it's great. That's what you will do with inverse probability weighting. It's the core of inverse probability weighting, that's the P. Um, is propensity scores. But using them on their own for matching is where things are bad. So there's this paper here by um, a professor at Harvard named Gary King and Richard Nielsen, where the title is super exciting, Why Propensity Scores Should Not Be Used for Matching. Um, there's actually a YouTube video that accompanies it. Um, it's actually super accessible. I recommend watching it um, because it's, it's a useful explanation for um, when you should legally use propensity scores and when you should not. Um, and it's generally for the sake of just matching, don't do it. Um, so I'd recommend watching the video for this. The paper is kind of denser and, and harder to get through, um, but the, the video is really accessible. So watch that if you want to and learn more about when it's legal to use these propensity scores. Okay, the last background piece of information you need to know for inverse probability weighting is the W part, or weighting. Um, so the idea of weighting is that you want to make some observations more important than others um, to make things more equal. So let's say you do a survey, um, and you know, based on census data, that the general population is 30% young, 40% middle-aged, and 30% old. And you know that that is kind of, those are the true values out in the world. So you do a survey, you do a, a presidential poll, you do something, and your survey comes back and you find that 60% of your sample is young, 30% is middle, and 10% is old. So if you look at that, you can see that it was kind of skewed incorrectly. You have too many young people and you don't have enough old people. Um, so what do you do? You just throw the survey away and try again and try to get 30, 40, 30? Um, no, because that's super expensive. So what you can do instead is wait. Things. Um, you can calculate a specific weight to scale down your young people and scale up your old people um, to make the survey more representative of the general population. So one way of doing that is by dividing the population by the sample. So if you say there should be 30%, we picked up 60%, divide, you take 30 divided by 60, so that means every one of your young people observations, you're going to give them half of the weight in like when you do the analysis. With old people, um, you take 30 divided by 10, so every old person is gonna be worth three times the weight. You're gonna count them basically as three people and young people will be counted as half people. Um, and by doing that, you're kind of helping balance the effect that old people might have on your study and getting rid of kind of the extra young people effects that you have and dampening that down. And so in the end, your findings will be more representative of the general population. This happens all the time in political polling. Um, in 2016, it was a huge um, talking point from the Trump campaign. They would complain about skewing the polls and they kept demanding that pollsters unskew the polls. Um, basically what they were saying is they wanted pollsters to not weight the surveys um, because good, reliable polling companies like Pew and other places, they weight all of their surveys um, to make it more representative. And so uh, skewing the polls back in 2016 was just weighting stuff. Um, and it's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. We want to do that. Um, the way you use these things is if you figure out kind of the average value um, of whatever your outcome is for young, middle, and old, multiply that average value by the weight, and then that will scale down the effect and scale up the effect. You can also do this in regression, and with the LM function, there's an argument called weights, and you can specify a weight column um, to your regression model, and then that will automatically scale things up and down for each of the rows that you have. 
um, which is cool. Most survey results that you download from Pew, for instance, will have a column called weights in it. Um, and so we can use that weight column to reweight the results to make it more um, generalizable or make it more reflective of the general population. So you know what propensities are, you know what weighting is. That brings us to this idea of inverse probability weighting. And so what we do with inverse probability weighting is we generate a weight column that measures something and gives some observations more importance than others. But instead of trying to find like a census to see what the general population is and do stuff like that, the weighting we're doing instead is measuring how weird observations are. And this is weird, not Western educated, rich industrial, whatever. Um, this is weird like didn't happen like it was expected to. Um, and I'll show an example of that. So basically, observations that have a high probability of treatment and then don't get the treatment, that's weird. Or observations that have a low probability of treatment and then do get it, that's also weird. And so we want to give those observations more weight. And we want to give the expected observations, like somebody who has some level of age and education, the propensity score says they have a 90% chance of getting treatment, and they got treatment. Neat. We're not going to weight them a lot because that's very expected, and so we're not going to do much with that. The actual formula that we use is this right here. Um, we take treatment, which is just a one or zero variable, whether like treat they were treated or not treated. You divide that by the propensity, so you need to calculate the propensity score, and then you add that to the inverse probability, so one minus treatment and one minus the propensity. And that generates a weight. Um, you don't interpret the weight at all. It's not really an interpretable thing. Um, what it does, though, is it measures basically the weirdness of the observation. So here's an example. Um, here's our automatic and manual transmission model. Um, and we're going to make a new column here with mutate, where we're taking this AM. This was if they're automatic or not, or manual or not. So manual is 1, automatic is 0. And then we already calculated the propensity score before using log using logistic regression. And then we're going to do the inverse probability here. So this is the formula you kind of just have to know. You don't have to memorize it. You can look it up. It's right here. Um, so you don't have to have it perfectly memorized, but this is how you do it with code. And so what you get in the end is a table that looks like this. Here's our miles per gallon. There's our whether or not it's manual or not. There's our propensity. We saw this before. And here's our weight column. What this is measuring is the weirdness of the row. So if you look down to row seven here, row seven has low miles per gallon, and so they have a very low propensity of, of being a manual transmission car. They only have a 9% chance of being manual. They weren't manual, and so the weight that they have is just one point something. It's boring. Um, it, was highly unlikely to be manual, and it isn't manual, and so it gets a low inverse probability weighting score. Row 8, on the other hand, if you look at the text here, it is highly likely to be manual, 70% chance of being manual, and it's not. That is unexpected and weird. And so we're going to give it more weight. We're going to give it like a 3. Um, there's no like uniform scale for these. Sometimes they go up to like 8 or 9. Um, often people will trim these and say anything greater than 10 will just shrink it down to 10. So if you have like an observation that is like 20, you can just scale that down to 10 um, because you can. There are other kind of robustness checks you can do, kind of truncating the weight column here. Um, but that's basically what it is. Like one would be totally boring, the most boring thing, 0% chance of getting treatment, it didn't get treatment, it's going to have a 1. Um, so that, that's basically what this is measuring here. Um, so if you run a regression then, you can still use the full data set. If we use this, this MT cars data set here. Um, and, but then when you want to measure the effect of miles per gallon on cars here, we know that there's a confound, or measure the effect of, of not miles per gallon, of, yeah, measure effect of miles per gallon on manual transmission. Um, if there's any other confounders that might influence the propensity to, to have a specific, um, to be manual, um, we control for all of those confounders in the logistic regression stage. 
So if we go back to the education and age example, those are confounders for the treatment. So we would run a logistic regression model to generate propensity of treatment um, based on all the confounders. And so we stick all of our confounders in that first stage, basically, and we use them to predict the probability of treatment. Then we can use the weights that we generate of how weird those observations are. And if we run a regular regression and just say treatment, like measure the effect of treatment on outcome, but weight by the, by the inverse probability scores, that will then make all of the adjustments and show the causal effect, um, which is kind of the magical part of this. What this looks like practically and why this is kind of potentially better than matching is you don't throw any data away. Um, so here's our education and age scatter plot. These are our confounders in our example. Um, and these are sized according to the inverse probability scores. So the bigger it is, the weirder and more unexpected it is. And so if you notice, this red dot is huge because it's in this world of blue dots where it, this probably should have been blue. So something happened here to make it not blue. And so that's weird. We need to give more emphasis to this. These red dots down here are smaller because they're also kind of clustered around other blue dots. And so it's not wholly unexpected that there would be red or blue here. Um, the dots way out here are tiny because that is 100% expected that you would have high education, high age, no treatment because nobody up here has treatment. So really all of these things get sized by um, kind of the weirdness score again. And then once you use those scores as weightings, or, or, or as weights in your regression model, what you're left with is the actual causal effect of your main variable on your outcome. Um, this is how you adjust for things. So rather than just sticking things in as control variables, you use them as control variables, but you use them to generate predicted probabilities and then use the predicted probabilities to generate inverse probability weights and then use those inverse probability weights to get the treatment or the effect of the treatment. So it's kind of a more roundabout process, but it works better because it handles things that are nonlinear. Um, that was the main issue with just controlling for stuff, is that assumes that every one of the columns that you stick in as a control variable has a linear relationship to everything else in the model, which is most likely not correct. But if you use them all in a logistic regression model to generate the propensity scores and then the inverse probability weights, that is a more robust way of handling all of the interactions between the different variables and generates kind of better adjustments um, for your causal effect. So in the example for today, um, we will walk through how to do matching and how to do inverse probability weighting um, and how to make these adjustments using confounders that exist in a DAG um, and we'll do kind of the proper way of, of, of estimating causal effects. Um, so go ahead and go over to the examples page and follow along the code there.